you like to lift your Bibles with me now? Say with me now. Father God in heaven, let your word be in my mind. Let your word be in my heart. Let your word be on my lips. Most importantly, let your grace show in my life. Amen and amen. The New Testament to 1 Thessalonians. This is 1 Thessalonians, don't forget, not 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonian church. It says in chapter 2 verse 1, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. So he's making it very clear straight away and reminding them that you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't for nothing that he came to them. Um, it says in verse 2, But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. So even though the Apostle Paul was going through it, <coughs> like many of us, sometimes we have to go through it in our service to God. It's not always plain sailing. You know, when we, when we first um, come out of Bible college or Bible uh, Baptist seminary or whatever it is or whatever, whatever teachings you've had as a basis, um, you know, there, there is this kind of romantic notion of serving God. We have this kind of this kind of romantic view and ideal of, of being able to be in a pulpit and praying and, and preaching and everyone's going to do what we say and it's all going to work out great and we're going to be seen to be great because we're doing God's work and we're going to feel good about ourselves and you know we're going to be literally hovering six inches off the ground because we're God's people and everything's going to work out fine. And hmm, <laughs> It don't work out that way. And so we have this romantic notion sometimes of everything being great. But it isn't. And it can't be. Because we are in enemy territory. And we have everything coming at us all the time. Once you start serving God, then there is a battle. You c and if you're not effective, there's no battle. If you're not doing anything for God, there's no battle. If you're sitting in a pew in a church and you're doing nothing for God, there's no battle. And unfortunately, that is possibly how some people go through their church experience. Belly aching about other people, what they're doing, and not doing anything themselves. And at the same time, thinking that they're great Christians. And sometimes even great leaders doing it, but they're not. And we need, we need to really serve God and stand up and be counted. You know, we're supposed to be, we're, we're likened to great oaks in the kingdom. You know, we're, we're likened to warriors. We're likened to conquerors. We're likened to soldiers. You know, putting on armor and having a sword and a, you know, we're meant to be doing something, not just pew fodder, not just people who just sit around and gain knowledge. I'm not going to do anything with it, but oh, I'm learning so much here. This is great. But what are you doing with it? This is what we're supposed to be doing. There needs, we need to be taken to task over this because there's too many of us that are kind of going for the holy huddle bit and not getting out there and doing things. So this is something that the Apostle Paul is saying. They were spitefully treated. Why? Why were they spitefully treated? Why does anyone treat anyone spitefully? Well, because they don't agree with you. And they don't like what you're saying. And they don't like the fact they have to be accountable. And this is the problem in the world. People don't want to be accountable. So if you start talking to them about a God and righteousness and having to be accountable and not doing the things that they're doing which are actually going against holiness and the righteousness, they get annoyed because they feel that you're putting them down. They will feel less than. They will feel that conviction in their spirits that they're not doing the right thing and they're going to aim that at you because you're the messenger. <laughs> so you're going to get it. You're going to get it any which way. And this is why it talks about us going through trials and persecutions. It's not plain sailing. There are times when everything's wonderful and the boat's out on the Galilee and we're doing well. And then there's the times when the storm comes and Jesus is actually walking on the water towards us and stops us like Peter from drowning because we suddenly lack faith and we start to sink. And that's the same in ministry. These were 
the foundation of the church. Christ is the cornerstone, the apostles were the foundation stones. And they were, Peter was sinking. And Christ had to, help me Jesus, I'm sick. And he picks him up. He's in the boat. The boat is the ark, the church. We know that. These are all, without over-spiritualizing the text, this is, this is all enacted prophecy. We understand what it means. But we have to have faith. And we have to love God the body of Christ, the church. We have to be prepared to be part of that and work it through. And there are times when it's all plain sailing, everything's great, you know, people love what you're doing, people love what you're teaching, and then there's other times when you come to some bumpy, gro bumpy uh, ride, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a problem, and things happen, things go on. And we know that underlying all this, Satan's right there all the time, right alongside us, you know, his hosts are there all the time to cause us problems, to oppress us, to inflict us, you know, to kill, steal and destroy, to deceive us. That's his work. That's the work of his minions. So this is going on all the time. So being spitefully treated is not uncommon. And OK, he was the great apostle Paul, but he still got the spiteful treatment. So it doesn't matter how great you are in the kingdom, you're still going to get spiteful treatment. What did Jesus get? Spiteful treatment. <coughs> they pulled out his beard. They hit him with rods. They struck him. Put a blindfold on him. Didn't know where it was coming from. He was beaten. He was shamed. Mocked. And then crucified. After being whipped half to death. You know, this is, this is our saviour. He's the head of our church. We are the church. We are the body. This is what's happening. And Paul is also, he's suffering this stuff. But he says, as you know, we were bold in our God. We weren't bold in ourselves. We weren't bold in the flesh. We were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. So even though there's all this conflict, even though there's all this persecution, even though you're really being spitefully treated and people are really hurting you in many ways, you know, there is a very malicious spirit going on that will hurt you wherever they can. Whatever they can do to undermine you psychologically, whatever they can do to hurt you, even physically, this is going to happen. It happens all the time when you're in ministry. You would be amazed at the kind of attacks you get. You will get them. They'll come. God knows your heart. That's the important thing. But he was actually giving them the gospel while he was in the conflict. And this is the same as Job, isn't it? When we look back to Job, Job had lost everything. He was in a right state. But he still wouldn't curse God and die. He still trusted God. And in the ministry, I mean, I've had it where I've ordained people. <laughs> Greta knows we've ordained quite a few people in different parts of the world. And what happens is that once people are in ordained, and, and or consecrated as bishops, suddenly it's like they expect you to show them and be with them and walk along with them all the time while they're doing their service instead of them being able to grow up and mature as Christians, as leaders, and to go and do it themselves. And when they don't get the support that they want, <gasps> oh, this is not very good, and they can go off to someone else. But we are not called to be in that situation where we have to have a wet nurse all the time. We're called to learn to become from children, youths, to mothers and fathers in the faith. Well, you know, when you become a mother or father in the faith, you have to have a sense of maturity. You know, Paul even talks about this. By now you should be teachers and yet you're still on spiritual milk, right? That's what he's talking about. And so when we come to this point, we've got to understand that, that Paul is expecting the church to, to grow, to develop, not just grow in numbers. I mean, we can all have, we, you, can, you can do all sorts of different things to get numbers and bums on seats. We can do that, but it doesn't work. It's a waste of time because there isn't the quality there 
people aren't necessarily there for the right reasons. You can have all sorts of different things that you do to get people into church, and they often do this in third world countries, where you know they, they feed the people. That's how they get them. They they start they get loads of rice and they feed people. That's how they get them into church. Well, of course it's good, and we know that healing is the dinner bell of the gospel. When we when we offer healing, that's something that people like. So they come for what they want rather than coming for God. You understand? They're seeking God's hands, not His face. And this happens all the time. But don't think that when we come into ministry that it's an easy ride. It's not. And he says in verse 3, For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. (coughs) But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. So we have to be aware of that, that God is the one who tests our heart, not men. We, we sometimes come up against things where people cause us problems, but we still have to understand that it's God who's testing our hearts. We're not here to please people, we're here to please God. And it's really important that we understand that. We're not here to hurt people, of course not. We're here to be peacemakers. But there will be people that want to hurt you if you're in the ministry. They will want to undermine what you're doing. And it isn't coming from a good place. And you just have to accept this is par for the course. You just have to understand that this is what's going to go on. So it's important to understand this. This is an apostle talking to you. This is an apostle saying, this is what it's like. You're going to be spitefully treated. You're going to suffer. It's going to be a problem. If you're really not mature enough for that, and you think it's all plain sailing and it's all gospel, it's all spiritual milk, you know, feed me, feed me, feed me, yeah. Change my nappies, feed me. It's not just that. You, you've got to grow up out of being a child, you know. You've got to grow up out of being an infant in the faith when you first come to God. And you then become a youth, which is where you say, okay, I know, I, I've got it now, I can handle it. I'm working on this, I'm maturing, I'm now a youth, I'm actually understanding some things, I'm actually working things out, I'm realising that it's not all, you know, fuzzy fuzzy feelings and, you know, warm feelings. It's, it's about maturing and, and being counted and being responsible and not only having the privilege but also having responsibility to follow God and be the, go- the person that God wants me to be. <coughs> And then we come on to being fathers. You know, Paul talks about children, youths, and fathers. Fathers and mothers in the faith where you you can, not only can you handle what God's giving you, but now you're going to teach other people. Now you're going to have spiritual children to look after. But you know, when someone, you've ordained someone, and you shouldn't be ordaining spiritual children. Amen? Amen? You should be... You should be ordaining fathers and mothers, not spiritual children, and not youths. You've got to watch the youth and see where they're going, because they still haven't got it quite, you know, complete, but they're doing well. Okay, that's great. But when they become mothers and fathers, and they put their money where their mouth is, and they actually start witnessing and gaining spiritual children, that is the time when people can be ordained, when people are actually following them, when people are actually learning from them, when they're being a good witness for other people and people are actually getting changed lives, that's when we ordain them. But it doesn't come without price. It doesn't come without cost. You know you know that when you ordain someone, if they're really out for God, they're going to go through it. But at the same time, you can't then you know, overcompensate and, and, and keep checking on your kids every five minutes because they're now men and women. And when people come in and they're ordained, you expect them to stand up for themselves. They can't come to you and say, oh, we need money for this or that. Pray about it. God's going to deliver you. God's going to bring your resources. God's going to be the one to provide. Not me. Not our ministry. We'll give you a bit of support. We'll teach you. We'll get you on the road. Of course. Of course. But there comes a point at which you need to stand up because you're now in your own bubble. You've left mum and dad and you're now in your own bubble. You're creating your own world situation. And 
Even in the ministry, we have to do this. But of course, in the church as it's gone on down through the ages, people have got stipends and people have got money from the church. The Apostle Paul didn't have any stipend. He was an itinerant minister. He, had, he made his own money. He was a tent maker. He wasn't working for the Roman Catholic Church as a priest and got his everything paid for. He wasn't an Anglican priest and you know, had a stipend and, and have everything laid on. <coughs> so we have to get away from that mentality and we have to accept the fact that when you're called if there's a call on your life you don't have to worry about what's where it's going to come from you just get on and do it and God supplies it and if you're a worker if you're someone who, who's put in effort into your ministry then it will, it will continue simple as that and you don't have to rely on other people you rely on God you think of the great people through the past that have built amazing ministries like orphanages and things like that you know I could m rattle off all sorts of names and they relied on God they didn't rely on people they relied on God who would put it on people's hearts to support what they were doing because they were doing the work of God the resources came and this is important but that's it. He, was, he said, we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. And so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. So he's pleasing God in this situation. And it says, for neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. Nor did we, did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles. So knowing that he was this great apostle who had all this knowledge and was given all this revelation by, by Jesus and, and had every right to say, oh, you know, it'd, be, it'd be nice to get some support from you guys, he didn't come in that, re he didn't come in that way. He didn't expect that. He didn't do the ministry for money. And there's too many ministers out there that are doing it for money. We know that. But this is showing us that this, that's not the way. We should be doing it for the right reasons. We're doing it not to please men and not to get money, not for mammon, but for God. And when we do that, God is going to give us all we need. He says, but we were gentle among you, just as nursing mothers cherish her own children. So we're there with the mother's you know, the youth, the children, the youth, the mothers and fathers, he's, he's coming like a, a midwife, you know, nourishing children, affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. So this is where the ministry seems to take a bit of a diversion from what you originally may think of it if you first come thinking, oh, serving God's going to be so wonderful, it's going to be so amazing, everything's going to go plain sailing because I'm in God's presence, I'm in God's you know, blessing because I'm doing God's work, I'm going to be blessed by God, everything's going to work out fine, but not realising that we have to carry on the work of Christ, which means sometimes sacrificing ourselves in the work there is a sacrifice that goes on if you don't turn up you're the leader <laughs> if you don't commit then nor would the sheep <laughs> you have to be there committed you have to sacrifice you have to do this work and this is what the Apo apostle paul is saying because you had become dear to us so it comes also with a different change of of heart, a different mindset. You're no longer in it because you're just learning stuff. You're no longer in it because you want to look good in front of other people. You're no longer in it because you are self-righteous and you want other people to see how spiritual you are and how, you know, how God is doing such wonderful things in your life. It's no longer like that. You know, you're doing it because you have a heart now, like Jesus, for the people. You want to see people saved. You want to see people's lives transformed. You want to see people develop and grow. You become a spiritual midwife. You become someone who becomes a father or mother in the faith. And as father or mother, guess what? The buck stops here. You can't blame the kids. 
if you're not a good mother or father, you can't blame the kids. You know, you have to be the one who's responsible because the children aren't responsible yet. And so we have to be those responsible adults and make a commitment and be there to help and protect and guard our children and do what, they, what we need to supply their needs, to nurture them. And this is what the Apostle Paul's doing in the church in Thessalonia. He's actually, he's actually coming as a father in the faith because they were dear to him. It wasn't just all a cerebral challenge to how can I get this ministry moving? How can I, how can I do this? No, you're doing it from the heart. The street ministers were born out of the heart. They weren't, it wasn't born out of let's do something, let's, let's have some sort of project. <laughs> there was a need. God put that need on my heart and other people. So this is where we need to understand what this, what this means, what the, what the Apostle Paul is, is telling us this for, is not just to make himself look good. It's to say, hey, wake up, folks. You know, we need to get on with the work that Christ started. He sacrificed himself. He saw himself as a servant of the Father. He only did what the Father told him to do. And we need to be doing the same. Okay? So this is something we need to understand. When we look at Moses, you know, when we understand Moses' heart, when we understand Joshua, they were serving, they were doing it for God. You often don't please people. My goodness, Moses didn't please very many, did he? They were always, they're always ready to kill him. <laughs> you know? So it, 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 we're not doing it for, for people, we're doing it for God. But that doesn't mean we don't care about the people. You have to care about the people too because they they become dear to you. So if you're in the ministry and you don't really care about people, get out of it because you're not in the right place. You've got to care about people. You've got to love people. You've got to see Christ in people. And that's really important. Amen?